War. War never changes. In the 20th century, America divided. The sides became so entrenched that it seemed impossible to break the deadlock. It was hell on earth. So many lives yielded to the carnage. And it was all over. Whether there was too much profanity in popular media. Hey, Cypher here. Culture became a battleground in America throughout the second half of the 20th century. From the counterculture, new left, neoconservatism, and the religious right, these clashes came to define a new political system that developed by 1980, which we still inhabit today, at least in the United States. This was what Prussians used to call culture kampf or culture war, which continues unabated to this day. We might use millennial lingo instead of Gen X slang, but when people complain about SJWs, chuds, and cucks, they're just plastering over older slang like hippie, square, and punk. It's a tiresome affect created by those bereft of intelligent vocabulary. Though the culture war still rages today, it's been pretty much the same BS for the last few decades. The recent kerfuffle over high school history curricula is no different than what happened in the 1990s over the national standard. We can't seem to break the habit and it's contributing to the political polarization of the United States. This episode is part of a series I'm doing on how we got to this point of political polarization in the United States. I've already covered the party switch in the first episode, so be sure to check that out if you haven't. But today, we're talking about how culture became a battleground in the United States. Before we get started, I want to thank my patrons and point out that the last episode in this series was demonetized because of a quote. Yes, a quote. Team YouTube straight up wants me to censor history. History tubers can't show swastikas when talking about Nazis, and now we're supposed to degrade the relevance of historical quotes? Seriously? To add insult to injury, they demonetized the preview version of this episode for supposed violence. You heard me correct. Can you imagine how stupid this supposed human reviewer has to be to come to that conclusion? Like the clips at the beginning are somehow violence, even though they're target practice. I'll never stop complaining about this disturbing trend of YouTube's worsening historical suppression, so please consider donating to my Patreon or buying some merchandise. As Team YouTube attempts to suppress history further and further, that's becoming an increasingly important part of keeping my productions going. Thanks, and on with the show. After World War II, the US experienced our greatest economic prosperity. We survived the war relatively unscathed, especially by comparison to the rest of the world. These were boom years for most Americans, in more ways than one. The abundance of wealth and glory of victory led to a sizable new generation of children, hence why they're called the baby boomers. As they grew up, Americans generally agreed on what direction the US should go, as in what counted as progress. Most were pro-New Deal and wanted to continue building a social safety net. There was an American dream worth achieving and a general consensus on how to go about it. While the US certainly had political drama, that consensus was never really in question, at least for the racial majority who most benefited from the status quo. People of color were not in the privileged class. Returning black veterans faced Jim Crow and retrenched racism. Even when President Truman desegregated the military in 1948, there is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry or religion or race or color. The Southerners of his party revolted, forming the Dixiecrats to attack the so-called communism of racial equality. Red baiting has always been a method of oppression in the United States, but Truman defeated the challenge, thereby continuing down the long path towards the party switch. Throughout the 1950s and early 60s, civil rights groups successfully protested Jim Crow throughout the United States. They gained favor through peaceful demonstrations. It was a tough fight, but their crowning achievement came with the passage of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts in 1964 and 65. 
older silent generation and baby boomers grew up with the fight to end Jim Crow, and now it was in its grave. These Americans still had that spirit of dissent, and a new issue came perfectly in time for them to forget about any further civil rights. The U.S. first actively intervened in the Vietnam War in 1962, but that was merely special forces. These were troops on the ground rather than advisors, but most Americans did not care at the time. It was just another small anti-communist conflict, like any number of others, just with a few more troops. But in 1964, a small naval skirmish with some North Vietnamese torpedo boats, and then two days later with what was assumed to be another attack, but was actually a false radar positive, meant that the U.S. was technically under attack in the Gulf of Tonkin. Congress gave President LBJ a blank check to escalate the war, and within a year, troops in Vietnam went from around 20,000 to nearly 10 times that. The war would eventually involve more than 500,000 troops on the ground, and considering the draft, as in conscription, was still being used, people had something new to protest. Dissent was widespread by 1965 and continued into the 1970s. They saw the consensus of the post-war years as stiflingly conformist and created their own society to oppose it. This counterculture was often more about pleasure than aimed at protest, but they forged a new way of thinking. Hippies, as they were called, had access to new drugs and contraception, creating a spirit of free love that defined the counterculture. Some even formed communes to practice this contradictory lifestyle in unison. Rock and roll became the primary musical genre a decade prior, and it quickly took on this ethos of protest and pleasure, filling the airwaves with nonconformity. The counterculture was everywhere, from popular media to hippie communes, but most importantly, at college campuses. The University of California at Berkeley had tried to crack down on student protests, citing that political activity was supposed to be off-campus. Just as they were transitioning from civil rights to anti-Vietnam protests, this crackdown made students reposition for simply the right to protest overall. Beginning in 1964, they staged a series of sit-ins for free speech and won by the following spring. It was formative of much to come as people used the movement to formulate a new kind of politics called the New Left. This was essentially the political wing of the counterculture. They took influence from the old left, like with Marxist thinkers, but sought to forge their own path which emphasized what the counterculture was about, namely peace and equality. It spread from campus to campus, state to state, until the New Left was its own political movement that came to prominence in 1968. After the Tet Offensive that year, public opinion soured on the Vietnam War. For it seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate, that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. Protest reached a record height. At the same time, both Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated that year, with MLK's death setting off another round of race riots throughout the country. The New Left spilled from a mere student movement to an international one, too. Much of the world was swept up in these protests. They even had a massive presence outside the Democratic National Convention that year, which was violently suppressed as an unlawful assembly due to Chicago refusing to issue permits. The new left was here and here to stay. Once the Vietnam War ended in 1973, they weren't finished. Peace may have been temporarily achieved, but civil rights still had a ways to go. There were movements like Red Power, Chicanos, and most prominently, a second wave of feminism which arose to push new civil rights. Liberal feminists wanted to continue where the suffragette movement had left off before World War II, that being the Equal Rights Amendment. It simply stated, Equal rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Radical feminists wanted a complete change in society to end patriarchy and institute gender equality. Both radicals and liberals could agree that they wanted the ERA, especially after the 1964 Equal Pay Act failed to be enforced by the federal government. Congress passed the ERA in 1972, and President Nixon endorsed it with a ratification period of just seven years. But it failed. 
The 70s were what one historian describes as the pivotal decade. That pivot was a turn towards the right wing of politics. Revelations of governmental malfeasance, energy crises, and stagflation after a decade of deindustrialization left the American public in what President Carter called, It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. The new left faltered in these troubled times and a significant opposition arose to fight them, called neoconservatism. It formed in response to the counterculture. Interestingly enough, a lot of the neoconservative intellectual leadership either came from the new left or the old left. They really got their start as Trotskyists, arguing with Stalinists at New York City College. People like Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell drifted from the left during the ferment of the 1960s, creating a conservative journal in 1965 called The Public Interest. Then there was Norman Poderitz, who steadily brought the Commentary magazine further to the right as he transitioned from anti-Stalinist Marxism to neoconservatism. They denounced the New Left for focusing on identity politics rather than materialist concerns of class like the Old Left. They subsumed issues of racism as a class problem. Even today, this is a standard neocon talking point, where they'll say it's class, not race. They also separated themselves from the old right by being less concerned with tradition as well as being openly hawkish. Neocons came to define themselves through opposition to the counterculture in a weird feedback loop of dissent. In keeping with their anti-Stalinist origins, they were itinerant cold warriors, pushing for further US intervention and clamping down on the new left, whom they frequently confuse with the old. Where the new left was about peace and equality, neocons were about American hegemony abroad and domestic anti-communism. But these ideals were quickly corrupted. Anti-communism, especially red baiting, had always shielded far more bigoted behavior. By labeling civil rights movements as communist subversion, federal power was used to undermine them through intelligence gathering and disinformation. Throughout the Nixon administration, he employed such tactics against the new left, but he didn't fully embrace conservatism. So neocons really rose to prominence by combating the ERA painting radical feminists as a threat to democracy by calling them communists. Assisting them was an even older form of conservatism. Evangelicals have always played a role in conservatism. Each Great Awakening was simultaneously a revival of past principles in opposition to newer movements. In the interwar years, they used the radio to sermonize against all the sins they saw from race music like jazz, flappers being scantily dressed, violations of prohibition, and worst of all, how the New Deal was a secret socialist plot to destroy America. It was time for a new Great Awakening in response to all those dirty hippies. The Fourth Great Awakening used television to preach opposition to what they called secularism, but was actually new left ideals like gay rights, feminism, and their most hated thing, abortion. In the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, the Supreme Court ruled that anti-abortion laws were unconstitutional because they violated a woman's right to control her own body, which was a tremendous win for second wave feminists. But evangelicals thought abortion was an affront to God and a form of murder, so they campaigned against it. This religious right was concerned with traditional values, unlike neoconservatives, but they could unite in their opposition to the new left. Neocons and the religious right turned their sights on what they saw as the most pervasive outlet for the new left, which was the counterculture, as in all the popular media that supported it. In their view, the culture industry itself was corrupting children into becoming hippies. They complained liberalism in Hollywood would destroy America, either by creating communism or by upsetting so-called traditional family values. Just as with the 1920s, this moral panic plastered over very real racism, especially when the religious right was willing to call disco race music, leading to its eventual demise. Their outrage fueled a turn to the right during the 1970s, just in time for Ronald Reagan to arise. 
he was considered a weirdo conservative outsider in his first presidential primary, but by 1980, he clinched the nomination. Combining old-line neoconservatism and the religious right into one somewhat incoherent cultural ideology. After all the malaise of Carter's term, the U.S. elected Reagan instead. The Reagan administration constantly attacked liberal influence and culture. Since the counterculture had obliterated the consensus view of American history, a new nationalism needed to replace it. It's America, love it or leave it. So conservatives brought back American exceptionalism to fight the new left. As Reagan put exceptionalism the night before the election, Well, America became more than a story or a byword, more than a sterile footnote in history. I have quoted John Winthrop's words more than once on the campaign trail this year, for I believe that Americans in 1980 are every bit as committed to that vision of a shining city on a hill as were those long ago settlers. He heightened the drug war while making it about a personal choice to just say no, pointed to a so-called gay lifestyle as the reason to ignore the growing AIDS crisis, and constantly derided academics for supposedly indoctrinating children into communism. The Senate even held hearings about how rock music was corrupting children, leading to record labeling. Actual policy didn't matter in this culture war. Spectacle did. It served to deny liberal policy, but culture warriors either ignored that or were simply unaware. The religious right attacked new mediums as well. For instance, video games would come under attack for supposedly causing worsening violence in the U.S. Now, studies indicate that connection isn't exactly true, though there is a link between aggressive behavior and increased game usage. But beyond that, American violence has been on a sharp decline since 1990, in complete contradiction to increases in players. But just as with record labeling, saying video games caused violence was simply a bunch of pageantry to avoid the actual issues of demographic change, poverty, gun control, and policing. By scapegoating popular media, conservatives could sneak past the more difficult policy decisions that come with these issues. As neoconservative Pat Buchanan put it years later, culture is the Ho Chi Minh trail to power. It was framed as a debate over our most fundamental ideals about who we are as Americans. This revival of nationalism subverted the debate over national policy. It's morning again in America. And under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. New Left concerns of equality and peace were instead portrayed as undermining America through their insipid cultural influence. I carried an M16 and yo, you carry that, that, that guitar. What do you want to do with your life? I want to rock. <laughs> But this was not merely a one-sided struggle. Perhaps the most intense battles of the culture war were, and still are, waged over school curricula. Not just for kids who have no choice in their school's policy, but in the halls of higher education. For instance, academia tried and failed to replace old programs of Western classics and history with more cosmopolitan or multicultural education. People scrutinized what was being taught and constantly complained about so-called anti-Americanism in the classroom, though it was really just a refusal to teach nationalism. Folks like to call it patriotism, but a true patriot acknowledges their country's wrongdoings, while nationalists prefer to deny it. This really swirled into being when Lynn Cheney became chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities in 1986. We decided to look at a group of institutions that seemed to us to affect the uh, quality of the humanities in American life. We looked at uh, cultural institutions like museums and libraries and state humanities councils, historical organizations, groups that bring humanities education, education in history and literature and philosophy to the general public. We looked at television and we looked at colleges and universities. 
She wielded that power to promote only unchallenging history like Ken Burns' Civil War, purposefully withholding funding from more substantial projects and hindering the history profession as a whole. Though historians professionalized around nationalism in the 19th century, they had turned from the blinding triumphalism of the consensus at the same time the counterculture had. These new left historians, or revisionists, were particular targets for culture warriors like Cheney. One of the most prominent fights came when a bunch of historians started to create a national standard that would work for either side of the culture war. This effort was even promoted by the American Historical Association, and the result was a seemingly perfect compromise of triumphalism and criticism. But any amount of criticism is intolerable to nationalists. You're indicting the history that I was taught. You were probably yes. taught. Yes, yes. It was a history, as I learned, where slaves happily picked cotton and lived in snug cabins with plenty to eat, because after all, they'd been rescued from African savagery. And as for women, when I grew up uh, learning history, they were notable only for their absence. I don't think we can go back. Nobody thinks we should go back. But Cheney, who now works at a conservative think tank, says in this new version of American history, a lot of great white men have disappeared. Congressmen attacked the document for being anti-American because it dared to teach children about the flawed nature of the Founding Fathers. They should understand uh, how Washington emerged out of the planter aristocracy of Virginia. And they should understand it was a slave-owning aristocracy. They should be a great man? He certainly was a great man. You mentioned slave-owning first. Well, he was a great man, no doubt of it. But do we need to weave America's sad and long history of, of racism and slavery throughout the entire timeline of American history? Yes, we do, because it happened. Sure, the national standard was compromised, but its worst flaws was actually its triumphalism. It died as the Senate discussed banning the National Endowment for the Humanities from paying for such works. Another critical time the history profession entered the culture war was with a Smithsonian exhibit. The National Air and Space Museum had restored the B-29 which had bombed Hiroshima, called the Enola Gay. But the exhibit was to include alternative theories for the atomic bombing, including the frankly ridiculous assertion that it was motivated by the racist idea of yellow peril. Mostly, it still told the orthodox story, but emphasized the death toll in a similar way to the recently opened Holocaust Museum, which was just down the street. World War II veterans, of course, lobbied against it. Others complained that it was somehow celebrating the bombing itself, and threw human blood on its fuselage. The Smithsonian closed the exhibit, and even now the Enola Gay is on display with barely any remarks upon her history there. The physical sciences were not immune to these controversies either. Sociologists criticized the prejudicial organization of STEM, as in science, technology, engineering, and math, and even questioned the very philosophy of science through theories like Thomas Kuhn's paradigmatic model. They showed that science had a long history of having to correct itself for its biased conclusions because prejudice harms knowledge. This was part of the rise of third-wave feminism, which emphasized unity against overlapping forms of oppression, simply called intersectionality. Scientific realism was sacrosanct, though, so some scientists began their own war on the liberal arts. They put fake articles criticizing science in sociology journals, which were not peer-reviewed, by the way, and then proclaimed they had disproven the liberal arts altogether. The label anti-science was used to defund liberal arts programs because they dared to question scientific authority. They complained that postmodernism is the liberal arts denying objective reality to impose relativism. This common complaint has no bearing on what postmodernism actually does, and in fact forgets that science is itself quite subjective, hence the problem with perpetuating prejudices in the first place. Postmodernism is merely a rejection of grand narratives, such as nationalistic history, and a look for something beyond modernity, as in a system of beliefs that deal with the fact that we are all inherently subjective beings, incapable of full objectivity nor non-stop progress. 
Now, that's not to say that some scholars don't take postmodernism to a ridiculous extent, but once again, this completely forgot the very real problems of prejudice in STEM that had actually fueled the science war. Instead, going with the imaginary narrative of scientists under attack by liberal arts. This was how absurd the culture wars are. Power politics behind them are subsumed by the spectacle. A new term that sticks with us overcame all these debates, simplifying the entire culture war into two words. Political correctness. No way, there's more PC bros here? Yeah, dude, Ohio State. Sweet bros, Texas A&M. Bro, I had no idea there were like-minded individuals in this town who defended social minorities. It was one size fits all. Originally, it referred to the sanctimonious speech that told people they had to use certain words instead of perfectly acceptable terminology, such as African American or differently abled, instead of black and disabled. Did you just use a term that excludes women from an occupation? Okay, let's back up. Ah! Did you just say okay. spokesman instead of spokesperson? But it degenerated quickly. Talking about the hypocrisy of our founding fathers? That's just being politically correct. Using terminology that is less hurtful? You're being too PC. Trying to stop or even elevate people from marginalization? That's just PC culture run amok. Political correctness is less an actual concern than one used to disregard serious issues of bigotry in the United States. Social justice, one, two, three! Woo, woo. I wanna be PC! Woo, woo. Much like the phrase social justice warrior today, it's a term of derision for anyone attempting to be a nicer person instead of the crusading left-wing bigots it's originally meant for. It hides real issues behind nonsense, which is the essence of the culture wars. In 1992, Pat Buchanan gave voice to the neoconservative bent of the culture war in his concession speech during the election. The Democrats had nominated Bill Clinton, who was seen as the kind of hippie culture warriors loathed, despite him being actually quite moderate socially and conservative in nearly every other regard. In fact, Democrats had often sided with Republicans against the new left throughout the preceding decade. For instance, Clinton's running mate, Al Gore, had actually fought for record labeling because he viewed heavy metal music as harmful for children. And his wife, Tipper Gore, was probably the biggest lobbyist who pushed those hearings in the first place. Since I seem to be the only person addressing this committee today who has been a direct target of accusations from the presumably responsible PMRC, I would like to use this occasion to speak on a more personal note and show just how unfair the whole concept of lyrical interpretation and judgment can be and how many times this can amount to little more than character assassination. This attack was contained in an article written by Tipper Gore which was given the form of a full page in my hometown newspaper on Long Island. I can say categorically that the only sadomasochism, bondage and rape in this song is in the mind of Ms. Gore. These people were often opposed to the new left, but neocons were to the point of abhorring any whiff of progress. Buchanan's speech is worth quoting in length, for it really defines the culture wars. He said, The presidency is also an office that Theodore Roosevelt called America's bully pulpit. Harry Truman said it was preeminently a place of moral leadership. George Bush is a defender of right to life and a champion of the Judeo-Christian values and beliefs upon which America was founded. Yes, we disagreed with President Bush, but we stand with him for the freedom to choose religious schools. And we stand with him against the amoral idea that gay and lesbian couples should have the same standing in law as married men and women. We stand with President Bush we stand with President Bush for right to life and for voluntary prayer in the public schools. And we stand against putting our wives and daughters and sisters into combat units of the United States Army. We also stand with President Bush in favor of the right of small towns and communities to control the raw sewage of pornography that so terribly pollutes our popular culture. We stand with President Bush in favor of federal judges who interpret the law as written and against would-be Supreme Court justices like Mario Cuomo who think they have a mandate to rewrite the Constitution. This election is about more than who gets what. It is about who we are. It is about what we believe. 
and what we stand for as Americans. There is a religious war going on in this country. It is a cultural war as critical to the kind of nation we shall be as the Cold War itself, for this war is for the soul of America. And in that struggle for the soul of America, Clinton and Clinton are on the other side, and George Bush is on our side. A common dog whistle used throughout these speeches is the term Judeo-Christian values. It's an imaginary idea with no basis in theology. In fact, the phrase is quite Orwellian, because George Orwell coined it. <laughs> But it really gained parlance with the religious right when claiming that they're being persecuted. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! This victimhood complex emphasizes a false solidarity with Israel after the horrors of the Holocaust. Conservatives like to claim that the U.S. was founded on such values, and that's the tradition they wish to preserve. The problem there being that many of the founders were deists and even explicitly wrote in the Constitution that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This also forgets that the Second Great Awakening was a conservative turn against the secularism of the Founding Fathers, making the idea that the country was founded on religious ideology whatsoever quite laughable to that generation. So preserving so-called Judeo-Christian values is nonsense, designed to drum up opposition to the New Left, as so much of the culture war is. It's kind of a brilliant strategy if you think about it, at least if that was fully intentional. Of course, for most culture warriors, they fervently believe their own rhetoric, no matter how easily disproven it is. Only folks like Buchanan fully understood the grift when he said culture is the Ho Chi Minh trail to power. His 1992 speech crystallized the sides of the culture war, forming the basis of reactionary politics to this day. From then on out, the New Left was supposedly Democrat, while Republicans firmly represented neoconservatism. There were blue dogs, who were basically conservative anti-Clinton Democrats, but Republicans were forming a new conservative coalition. They signed a pledge during the 1994 midterms that was a contract with America. With this, they swept the election in what is called the Republican Revolution. The new speaker for the House was Newt Gingrich, who was a neoconservative historian. He'd fought the new left from his college podium back in the 1970s and arose to prominence through fighting the culture war. He'd set the pattern for Republicans under Democrat presidents by constantly obstructing any Democrat legislation while appealing to culture war rhetoric like Buchanan. By threatening filibusters and killing legislation in committee, they deadlocked Congress, allowing for more and more conservative legislation. When something managed to get through the deadlock, they'd rely on culture war rhetoric to say that anything slightly liberal was an existential threat to the soul of our republic. With these tactics, Gingrich managed to shut down the government for 5 and 21 days. Then with Bill Clinton having lied under oath about sexual misconduct, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. They impeached him, showing off the lascivious affair for media outrage, rather than the actual charges of perjury, which obviously would not garner as much attention. By the end of the 1990s, the pattern was set for how actual issues would be covered up with outraged rhetoric. It's purely a strategy of attacking the opposing side rather than real engagement with policy. The culture war continued and exemplified America's gradual political polarization. But remember, it's mere surface dressing. We are currently in what historians call the Sixth Party System, which began sometime between 1968 and 1980. The culture wars belied a great rightward shift in politics which culminated in Reagan's ascendancy. But that rightward shift had one more piece than neocons and the religious right. Some historians have called our current era the Second Gilded Age, yet both Republicans and Democrats share the ideology that has brought that about. Economists and political scientists call it neoliberalism. Most politicians nowadays are neolibs, but it really picked up steam during Carter's presidency and Reagan fully adopted neoliberalism. Every POTUS since then has been a neolib. And yet, despite this seeming political unity, it has served to divide Americans more than anything else. But that will have to wait for the next episode. 
As we have seen, first, the counterculture challenged American nationalism, giving rise to the new left's emphasis on peace and equality. Neoconservatives and the religious right opposed them and their pop culture influence. The culture war is an absurd overlay for these deeper simmering tensions. Yet, we continue to fight it, and we continue to not address the issues underneath. And that is another reason why we're polarized. King. <laughs> King. Do you need to get out of here? Do I need to put you out? More? And it was all over. I was supposed to take off the sunglasses, but okay. <laughs>